Good evening. The problem of opiate use and addiction has become such an epidemic in the Fargo-Moorhead metro area that law enforcement, physicians, ministers, and addiction counselors are meeting weekly as part of a mayor's blue ribbon commission to come up with an actual plan to meet the problem head on. Tonight, some staggering numbers, all sons and daughters of someone you likely know, those who have struggled with addiction and lost the battle, those trying to recover, but finding that it is a daily, nightly battle for life. Imagine what it must be like for some of these men and women attending dozens of funerals this past year for somebody's young son or daughter. In fact, in my hands, I hold more than 24 funeral programs from young people in our area who have died from overdose. Talk to anyone who struggles with an addiction. It's an evil grip that not only impacts the individual, but family and friends. In the last few months, dozens of families in our area have buried their children as an opiate crisis sweeps the valley. As we talked with families from our region about the insidious journey of addiction, one thing is clear. The stigma of the disease must be erased. And until the community looks at it as a disease, our young people will continue to be lost. Chase Fligginger was that kind of kid every neighborhood loved to have. He was just the most outgoing, carefree. He did not look at anybody in a bad way. This is at a little apartment we had in Grand Forks. Precocious little boy whose pictures today tell the story of a classic mid-America childhood. What, what did he say? Don't, don't let stupid things, you know, bother you. He, he, meaning what he said was there's more important things like kindness and generosity and uh, making people feel good instead of being judgmental. An athlete and outgoing kid who befriended anyone. He accepted everybody. He was always trying to bring light into a situation. No matter how hard it was, he could find a way to make somebody laugh. He could talk to people so easily. But in his late teens, Chase started using. And like many with addictions, he hid it from his family well. He would tell me, I can control it. Because we honestly didn't know how serious it was. He, he was well aware that he had a problem and knew he wanted to stop it. And it's still time after time just kind of took over him. So I kind of missed the big, the big picture. I was so focused on getting him well and getting him, you know, he had so many dreams and so many things he wanted to do. He was like, he could be anything he wanted to. Chase came from a tight-knit family. His sister Deja, mother Sue, big fans of his, and they worked to get him help, choosing some of the best treatment centers in the country. But the addiction had such an incredible hold on the 20-year-old. One time he told me, I, I think this is horrible, Mom, that I cannot ever be cured. Chase's mother Sue was in India on business in October when she got the call from a nurse in the emergency room. They said, okay, we'll put the phone next to his ear. I was just screaming, it's like, I, you better not, you, nothing better happen, I'll be there. He just hang in there, just hang in there, I'll be there. Chase had fatally overdosed. I mean, you're looking at him, it's just like he's sleeping. You're not fully processing anything. And it's also raw, it's such raw pain. It's unlike anything I've ever felt. The days following Chase's death are somewhat of a blur for the family. Friends and others are wishing they could have done more for him. His mind kept going back to wanting, even though he knew the consequences and everything else. He's like, I just can't stop. Chase's mother found a letter in her coat pocket one day. Chase had written it. He was struggling. I'm one of the lucky ones. I was staring death in the face and didn't even know it. I believe everything happens for a reason. That's all he wrote, so he was trying really hard. Just months after his death, Chase leaves behind those who not only are grieving his loss, but today vow to fight to save others. I know it's hard. He would say it's so hard, Mom. I want to just go back to that blue house 
And I want to lay on the couch with my blue blanket and watch Tom and Jerry. That was his favorite show. And that's all he wanted to do, to, you know, feel safe, because he didn't feel safe anymore. He didn't know it was so beyond his control. Yeah, I miss him a lot. The mayor's Blue Ribbon Task Force is the biggest undertaking the metro area has ever waged in this war on addiction. Experts from prevention and intervention are joining those with treatment and law enforcement experience, tackling issues that face families dealing with addiction. The red tape of insurance, deductibles, space available, wait times, and cost. Mike Gaspari of First Step Recovery has been working with addicts for 23 years. He supports a navigator program to help those addicted get the right help at the right place. Yeah, you know, that's one of the focuses of our prevention group. Uh, is to, to do that community education because you can't fight a problem you don't understand or think is there. Another issue facing our community, the need for medical detox to help the dozens who need it every day. A lousy reimbursement, or in some cases, not at all, stands in the way. When we return, paramedics and first responders in our region are seeing record numbers of overdose calls and using reversal drugs in an attempt to save those addicted. There have been times where paramedics from FM Ambulance have responded to three overdose deaths in one week, sometimes two people in the same room dead. As we continue our in-depth community response to addiction in our metro area, this number hit us like a bag of bricks. Paramedics with FM Ambulance had to use the overdose reversal drug Narcan 99 times last year. That number does not include the more than a dozen who died from overdose here. As a trained paramedic with FM Ambulance, Stefan Winkler has seen it all. And then it's not even all. Because every time you think uh, that, that's got to be the craziest thing, there's something else that tops it. But this past year has been one for the record books. The ones that, you know, I died on scene were always the harder ones to deal with because there's always family on scene. A historic number of overdose deaths as an opiate crisis blankets our metro area. You never know what you're getting. Uh, so. It, could be laced with uh, things like fentanyl or bath salts. Area law enforcement and paramedics can actually gauge when a new batch of heroin hits the market here in the metro area. There's an increase in overdose calls and the demand for Narcan goes up. Paramedics here administering 99 doses of Narcan in the last year, an effort to save those who have overdosed. 6741600. In some cases, multiple overdoses a week. And I always remind people that you know, you were seconds, if not minutes, from dying. The impact on first responders and EMS workers, well, that's not in the training manual. Most of the paramedics here at FM Ambulance are in their 20s, early 30s. Uh, so it's difficult seeing people your own age or younger, uh, you know, losing their life because of this horrible drug. The problem is nationwide. Recently, there were 27 heroin overdoses within four hours, including one death in Huntington, West Virginia. In British Columbia, there have been a record 755 overdose deaths in the last year. And now the sobering numbers for our area. In the past year, 12 opioid overdose deaths in Fargo, 19 total in Cass County, 7 opioid overdose deaths in Moorhead Clay County, part of the 24 911 calls for overdoses. Uh, this last year, the 12 deaths was unprecedented. And it's why we had the huge reaction working with the community all the other different resources, addiction resources, the hospitals, even the pharmacies are getting involved to try to stop this from getting worse and to bring it back to where we were before where people are not dying from overdose deaths. Longtime law enforcement officers in our region have never seen a year like this. And as part of the mayor's Blue Ribbon Task Force, law enforcement is joining others in the prevention and treatment community and getting a handle on the crisis. That means taking some of the main dealers of heroin and fentanyl off the streets and putting them in prison. Uh, we're taking some of the dealers, which we identify them, off the street. We're arresting them. Uh, we currently have, dealing with opiates, 15 federal indictments from cases we've originated. Most of those from an overdose case. Not all, but most from an overdose case. While the dealers may be here, much of the dangerous product is coming from China and Mexico. Cops see it, hospital emergency rooms witness it, 
We're talking about the misuse of prescription drugs and the role that plays in opiate addiction, especially for teens. Prairie St. John's has a seat at the Mayor's Blue Ribbon Commission. Addiction counselors and chemical dependency directors say they are seeing a shift now following a nationwide cry to curb doctor shopping and cut down on widespread prescribed use of painkillers, counselors are now noticing a change. Folks don't have as easy of access as they once did to pills. Um, so then they are turning to heroin and heroin's much cheaper. A pill on the streets can go for $20 a pill, whereas heroin is very much cheaper. When we come back to addicted. That's why it's so amazing that we're sitting here today because we're all alive, we're all survivors. When those who are addicted finally stop using, the recovery is lifelong. The story about leaning on each other when we return. Imagine that breakfast means waiting for a restaurant to throw out food in the garbage, or a good night's sleep means a bus shelter. Tonight, we continue our in-depth look at a crisis we continue to witness in our community, addiction. If we had not witnessed the meetings and heard the stories firsthand, you would think that we were reading a screenplay for a new Netflix show. But Joe and Sarah have a life of recovery now that is all about improving the lives of others. And it's a full-time job. It is a crisp cool winter night in Moorhead. Hey guys, my name's Joe and I'm an addict. Joe. Hey Joe. Um, some of you have heard me speak before, some of you haven't. 39-year-old Joe Moran is about to tell his story to addicts who are in recovery. When I, when I started to drink, it was my first uh, drug of choice, um, I felt okay. And I liked that feeling because I had never had that before. Joe started using at the age of 13. Alcohol, pot, meth, and then whatever drug was offered to him. You know, that was my life. Um, three years I lived like that. You know, the winters were horrible. I remember sitting in bus shelters, those plastic plexiglass things with no fronts, and the under, you know, they're all open. He told these young recovering addicts that addiction nearly killed him over and over again. That's why it's so amazing that we're sitting here today. Because we're all alive, we're all survivors. It took 20 years. But now he's celebrating a half dozen years of a drug-free life. We have a disease, but we choose whether or not it defines us. My disease does not define me. My recovery defines me. And these young people who are leaving the life of addiction... I'm not proud of my past, but I'm no longer ashamed of it either. No, they needed to hear this. One thing recovery has taught me is it's okay. This story of despair that now has chapters of success. This is about as close to the trenches as you can get. Sarah Shadowland Grass is in recovery. The young Fargo mom has a life story that reads more like a made-for-TV movie. It really was. Um, it, like, the police showed up at my apartment the same time I did, took me aside and told me that he had driven into the river. Just 13 days after her baby daughter was born and then hospitalized in ICU, her husband, an addict, was in a car crash and died. I've gone through a lot of loss. I've had to come back from the ashes over and over again. <laughs> Like I said, if it wasn't for the network of friends that I had made whether and family, whether they were blood or not, through this recovery program, I would have never stayed clean. We still such an inspiration. We have no idea. Thank you. Everything I'm going through, I need to hear this. It's been a long evening, but fruitful. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> Others heard his story of recovery. The hope now. Normally. <laughs> Good job. Thank you, my Sometimes friend. These young men and women who heard it will live it as well. Talk to you guys later. This community response to the opiate crisis and issues with addiction have sparked the mayor's Blue Ribbon Commission. City leaders and experts in the field coming together so the metro area can not only tackle the problem but come up with solutions. We've been highlighting some of those solutions, including early intervention getting young people the help they need on the front end before there is full-blown addiction. And we are hearing availability of care is not the barrier, but lack of information for families, including insurance red tape and cost. If we can intervene early by saying, okay, you know what, you're stressed out, you're anxious, you may be dealing with depression here. We know those are all precursors 
to the use of drugs, to use uh, whether that's alcohol or opiates or any of those kinds of things. So let's offline that. Let's find ways to reduce those stressors. Let's find ways to, to you know, deal with why you're not very happy. And this should tell you just how many people are using opiates in our region. At the Fargo-Moorhead Good Neighbor Project, organizers are sometimes driving around in the middle of the night making house calls as part of the needle exchange program. The Moorhead Drop-In Center provides discreet testing for HIV and hepatitis, as well as an active syringe exchange, as well as naloxone training. Naloxone, or Narcan, is used to reverse an opiate overdose. Families from our metro area have come here for training in how to use it when their loved one overdoses. Good Neighbor also hosts a number of support groups and meetings of those battling addiction or living in recovery. If they're going to use them, it saves lives to have somebody there watching them and making sure that they're not dying. We'll be back in a moment to hear the sobering story of one family's battle with addiction and what they want you to know. When you have a child that you love and you're trying to fight the addiction with them, it's like fighting a demon. The story of Matt Trainer. when we come back. Tonight, a plea from two mothers who recently had to say goodbye to their sons. Nikki Anderson is the mother of 26-year-old Lucas Anderson. Lori Morse is the mother of 24-year-old Tyson Cheney. The two women didn't know each other before the deaths of their sons. Now there's a special bond, and they are inspiring others. Our kids were gifts. Right. They were beautiful, beautiful <laughs> gifts. The loss of their sons has brought Nikki Anderson and Lori Morse together. Because they did not ruin our lives. No. No, they enriched our lives. That's, it's the best gift. It was like having a, a bright star fall down into your hands and you could love that star and it gave you so much brightness, brilliance, and joy. And then you have to put it back because there's no guarantees. And... We just didn't want to put them back, did we? Both can describe their sons in motherly detail. Our boys were so much alike, <clears throat> so sweet and tender and hearts of gold. And Lucas Anderson, an incredibly talented musician with Hollywood looks and a family he cared deeply for. But mostly I appreciate him for his thoughtfulness and his kindness and his ability to not judge anybody. Right away, many suspected the two boys died of heroin overdoses in separate incidents. And they said it was heroin. That was totally blindsided us. And I'm like, it can't be. It can't be. It wasn't. It was not heroin. But it was fentanyl. And these two mothers knew their sons would not choose this, to leave their families like this. But you know what? It doesn't matter what drug it is. It doesn't matter. Neither of our boys got what they thought they were getting. And what they got was intended to kill them. And they want our community to galvanize against the scourge. Everyone says, oh, well, your kid was a junkie. No. People don't realize it's the people sitting next to him at church. It's the people in the cubicle next to him at work. The two women didn't know each other until the loss of their two sons, just days apart. Tonight, a bond and a story of loss that has inspired them to share the grief, to spare others from it. It's not how you left us, but what you did while you were here that defines you. There is a common thread that runs through the heart of many of these addiction stories. Young people who have battled depression on top of everything else. Brian Raft of old knows all too well this story of addiction and depression. He has dealt with both, and he lost his 19-year-old son Josh to addiction and depression just two years ago. Brian continues his recovery. Working full-time and finding that faith has been instrumental in his life after addiction and dealing with the loss of his son. It's heart-wrenching. It, it's got a whole new meaning for me now. I, I look at that paper and I see a young kid, 20 years old, who died, and I feel for their parents instantly because it's, it's indescribable. Sit down and talk with any family that has battled addiction. The experience is unlike any crisis they will face in life. 
often an emotional, physical, financial roller coaster. Right now, this community is facing record numbers of overdoses and deaths the last 12 months. One thing we've discovered from our many talks with addicts and their families, addiction has such a grip on those who use it that people will do anything to get that high, even if it means those decisions will devastate a family and those who love them. You could find Matt Trainer up before dawn if it meant a trip on the water. He loved hunting and fishing. It was his absolute favorite thing to do. Here's his Vexlar for ice fishing. There it is, see? Still works. Matt had outdoors in his blood. This gun got a lot of use, I'll tell you that. And shot a lot of birds with this gun, that's for sure. Pheasants and fish, ducks and decoys. He could get permission to hunt on posted land like nobody else. You can see all the calls. He was a fantastic duck and goose caller. It meant time with family, time alone. We all tried to spend a lot of time focusing his energies in that direction because that was positive activity. And while this popular, much-loved kid could do anything... And, you know, Matthew was a great kid. He was a good boy. Right. Yeah. Straight-A student. He was the point guard on his basketball team. Started every team he was on. Great soccer player. And obviously great outdoorsman. But, you know, in the end, he was more interested in doing the drugs than he was in all the other things that he used to love. Addiction was the game changer. It's hard to understand for someone who doesn't have that. Mm -hmm. I, I could never understand what you would give up all of this for that. Parents Mike and Mary Beth Trainer, siblings, a loving family surrounded Matt, helping him get treatment over and over again. We were always working to try to get him better. There was a lot of times crisis, you know, with it. It's once they're in treatment, it's great, I think, because mm -hmm. you, you have this hope that they're going to get better. There's hope again. Still, the lure of that high, those drugs, allowed addiction to have a hold on Matt nobody could break. When you have a child that you love and you're trying to fight the addiction with them, it's like fighting a demon. It really is. I mean, I can't describe it any other way. It is because you want, you'd do anything to have that child or your kid better. And it seemed like everything we tried would just get sidetracked. Last summer, the addiction cost Matt his life. He died at the age of 25. I, um, I found him, you know, at the lake. And I didn't, I know I didn't sleep more than an hour a night for three or four weeks because I'd close my eyes and that's all I would see. And the only way I could get any peace was to pray. I mean, I'd pray for hours on end. And I still have to do that. I'll still, you know, the shadows always come at night. Matt loved the lake, the cabin. His parents have built a special rock and religious garden there to remember him. Sometimes I walk by this spot and I have peace, but sometimes I walk by it and I have absolute horror. And I said, if I have that there, I won't have the horror. I don't know how you could have the experience that we have and not have the faith behind you I think, I don't know that I could do it. And we prayed. We prayed together so much. Novenas and prayers. And we no. said one time, I don't know, you know, if our prayers are being answered. But they were. So now what? Well, Matt's parents serve on the mayor's blue ribbon panel as our community wrestles with this opiate crisis. Maybe their presence can help another Matt or another family out there. We want to make the point that you're not alone. There's nothing wrong with you as parents, but try to get your child help if you can. You know, it didn't work out for us, but it may work out for you. Life will never be the same. It was a long 10-year battle, and now an emptiness that nothing can fill, except... I think his friend took it. The friend was in the back of the boat 
Matthew was in the bow and they were casting for muskies. Matt at sunrise, not at sunset, not the end, but for Matt, perhaps the beginning. And it kind of reminds us that, you know, he's, he went away from us, but we'll see him again, you know. I know we will, and he'll be healthy and happy then, you know. And Matt's family has now started the Matthew Trainer Memorial Fund, an effort to talk about, learn from, and prevent addiction. Another tool and weapon as our metro area wages the battle against opiates and tries to help those addicted. Good night.